Justin, thank you, and uh, thanks for having me here today, and thanks to all the registrants that have signed up. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a, a great event. Um, I appreciate you, everyone blocking out some time to learn more about the opportunity at Grace. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to go through a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we are going to do a kind of a two-part uh, event today. At the first part, uh, John's going to go through um, some the background of Grace, some of the, the updates about the product development and business development, and um, then we're going to transition to a live Q&A session. Um, and to participate in that, uh, if you, you see a, a questions tab in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, um, you can submit questions at any point during the presentation and we're going to try to get through as many as possible during the Q&A session. Um, and anybody that we're unable to get to live, we, were, we will be following up uh, via email. Um, in addition, a recording of today's event will be shared with everyone who registered. And so um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to John and, and we'll go ahead and get things started. Great. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, so my name is John Belay. I'm the CEO of Grays. Uh, we're building an electric autonomous, autonomous lawnmower for the commercial landscape industry. Uh, there's a picture of our version three, which is the one that we've built to date. And we've used that on pilots, uh, testing, demonstrations, and now we're ready to, uh, you know, with the funding, go to the next level, which will be our gamma model. So with that, I want to tell you a little bit about the landscape industry. Um, it's $129 billion addressable market. Uh, we're looking at uh, the majority of it, which has grass to be mowed. So our target market are landscape maintenance companies. These are anybody from, uh, you know, the individual owner that's got a pickup truck and a, uh, a trailer that you see on the highways towing their, their mowers and rakes and things around all the way up to uh, the, the largest landscaper in the country is over $2 billion a year in revenue. You can see that uh, the top 100 in the US account for $11 billion of revenue. So large geographic all over the, the United States and uh, you see them everywhere. Also golf courses. We're seeing that golf courses is a great opportunity for us because of the, not only the roughs, but the fairways uh, we don't want to get into the, uh, the, the putting greens that's a little bit more specialized than we want to get into, and there's a lot more acreage of fairways and roughs. There's almost 39,000 public golf courses across the globe, and the average annual cost is about $850,000 a year, and the majority of that is in labor. Another big market is municipalities. Uh, we've done a pilot program with the city of Glendale. Uh, they've got a lot of city parks. There's also a lot of uh, cities that have uh, freeway medians, freeway, the sides of freeways that need to be mowed on a regular basis. And then there's also some very large customers where it would make sense to keep our mowers on site and using them seven days a week. That's for solar farms, airports, cemeteries, anywhere with either large lawns or large grass and weeds that have to be kept at a certain height. So you, you probably know this, but there, there's a huge labor shortage. It was really big before COVID and it's only gotten worse since COVID. And it's very difficult to find people that want to sit on a mower all day or go work out in the hot sun or the cold rain. So there's a lot of turnover in the landscape world. Many times people will lose people that they've, they've had trained up for you know, 25 cents, 50 cents an hour more to go to their competitor. And you can't blame them. These are people working for themselves, for their families. It's just very difficult to keep and uh, retain employees. So the other thing is most landscape projects have a lot of lawn. And because everybody needs to mow that lawn, it becomes very much a commodity or a loss leader where they really make their money is in other tasks like irrigation, uh, integrated pest management, and this is areas where those people that do the work get paid higher per hour. So mowing is, like I say, it's a loss leader. You can see them taking jobs at zero to 10% margin on the mowing. So we've worked with, you know, one of our partners for a long time, Mainscape. They're a very large landscape company in the United States. Uh, they, we've worked with them and part of our development, as well as they've shared a lot of 
uh, numbers with us. They do a great job on tracking all the various costs. And you can see on the left with gas powered uh, manually operated mowers, they're, they're doing a better job than most. They're getting 8% profit. You can see fuel at 8%, uh, wages, a big portion of that 33%, other costs. And they believe that with the autonomous electric mower, that will result in a profit of 24%. You can see the fuel goes down to 3%. Wages cut almost in half to 16% and profit going up to 24%. But I like to think that when somebody utilizes an electric autonomous mower, they're not gonna just you know take that, that savings and put it in their pocket. They'll be able, because their cost structure is lowered, they'll be able to offer their services to more people, more companies, increase their market share so maybe that profit goes to 12%, but they've lowered their cost to be much more competitive. So let me just tell you a little bit of grays at a glance. So we've got over $32 million in non-binding letters of intent. We've got, like I said, Mainscape. Uh, they've ordered a lot of our mowers. Sundale Country Club, that's a golf course in Bakersfield. They've ordered 10. Other thing I wanna point out is because of the advertising we do, the crowdfunding, LinkedIn, uh, we've got customers, Skyline is in Australia. They've ordered 50 mowers. Uh, PSD, they're a distributor in the UK. They do a lot of work, not only in England, Ireland, but also Western Europe. They've ordered 70, which is two containers of mowers. The thing is, we've just got to get to that point with the, uh, the product development to get to our gamma model so we can get to production, so we can go to market. So we've got strong customer pipeline where a lot of and a lot more companies than this keep asking when are you going to have it available we want to buy it we know it's coming so again it's all about the product development so this is our product development team speaking of product development we're really strong on the engineering side felix alvarez he's our cto he comes with great experience over 50 designing utility patents uh, not only having worked with Amazon and Apple, but a lot of experience with Waymo. That's the Google company that's building autonomous vehicles. So he's got an under the hood, so to speak, look at autonomous vehicles, and he's bringing a lot of that knowledge to what we're doing at Graves. And we're actually able to kind of piggyback on the autonomous vehicle industry by utilizing a lot of the equipment they use, the GPS, the LiDAR, sensors, et cetera. Uh, Praveen Nuli, our COO, he comes with ex excellent experience as supply chain from Pepsi, and he's been a great help, especially as we had all the supply chain issues as we were coming out of COVID. Jeff Bull, he's a, a great designer. He's part of the reason our mower looks so good. Uh, you know, when we were going through the design phase, I said, number one, it's gotta be industrial. You know, these landscapers, haven't been in, a landscaper myself, Landscapers beat up this equipment. It's going to be in, you know, all kinds of conditions, rain, heat, etc. They said it's got to be industrial, but it's got to kind of look like Mad Max. It's got to look futuristic. It's got to look good. I think he's done a great job on where we're at now and ultimately the next gamma model that we are developing. We've also got some really smart engineers, Amr, Manamet, Arthur Levy. He uh, is our mechanical engineer. He built our, you know, we went from a, a 60 inch mow deck that you had to manually lift and lower with chains and bolts. He made an actuated mow deck that you can raise and lower from your iPhone or tablet, which is great because ultimately as we progress with our technology, the, the cameras, the sensors will be able to identify how tall is the grass and therefore automatically adjust that mower up and down because you never want to take more than a third of the blade of grass off. It's not healthy for the lawn and that will be able to do it. Again, we're trying to make the mower as user friendly as possible and not require a lot of manual labor. Uh, Mike Louis, our principal electrical engineer, this is critical what he's doing because it's all about the batteries, the battery packs, uh, the battery life and the recharging. So that's a, a big part of what we're doing. Also, you know, Manamit on the software. Uh, he's done great with our obstacle detection. If uh, somebody walks in front of it, the mower will stop. Uh, but part of what we're doing with the product development is really working on that obstacle avoidance. 
that's the real difficult point where it will know that there's a, a tree coming up and because of the AI, it will get to know each individual site and work more efficiently, go faster, and know that it's an existing obstacle that it can then uh, you know, go around more quickly. So let me talk a little bit about our mower and some of the features. Uh, the, the biggest thing is safety. Um, from the very beginning, you know, we've always talked about what we've got to do is do whatever an electric 60 inch mower can do, but it's got to be doing it autonomously and it's got to be doing it safely. Well, it's those last two that's really difficult. It takes a lot of the product development and the engineering time. But again, safety is number one. So we do have safety sensors. We've got 360 degree LIDAR. What that does is it throws impulses of light all the way around it. It reflects it back and it uh, virtually sees what is out there. We also use uh, GPS for path planning to calculate where the perimeters that you want to mow within and any interior perimeters, any areas you don't want to mow within, like a pond or a planting area. Uh, we've got a smart command center. This is important. Uh, we're making it as user friendly uh, to the person that's operating it on an iPhone, a tablet, a computer. It is electric powered. Like I said, it's got 40 kilowatt hours of battery. So it will run at least eight hours of runtime. Now, again, that's going to be dependent upon terrain, the thickness of the grass, uh, you know, the, the hills, etc. But, you know, it should easily go eight hours of runtime with uh, conventional lawns. We've got a 60 inch tri blade motor deck. These are just rotary blades like you're used to seeing on conventional horticultural sod lawns. And, uh, the, and so the, the reason we went with 60 inch is, and we'll get into this as far as the speed, but it can mow a lot per acre, but it's also small enough to fit into a conventional landscape trailer that you see on the highways going from job to job to job. Now, the other thing I think you'll notice is because the MODEC is out front, it makes it very easy to lift that MODEC up so you can change out the blades and sharpen them which is about the only maintenance, that and blowing the debris off of the MODEC because a clean MODEC uh, leads to more efficient mowing. So it is a mulching mower. It leaves the grass clippings on the lawn, which helps uh, put micronutrients back into the lawn. It also, uh, it does not require laborers to come and you know take the bags of lawn, take it to a, a landfill. So it's, it's very environmentally friendly. But that is, I think, you know, one of our key attributes because that MODEC can go up, easy to maintain, change the blades. But also, uh, not only did Arthur build the deck so it's actuated so it can be moved up and down, but he put a quick release on it so it's very easy to detach the MODEC from the chassis, which leads us to the ability to put other attachments on there besides the rotary MODEC. The other thing, fully electric. Um, you know, I've, I've grown up in California, you know, worked in California uh, most of my life. And in California, Governor Newsom a couple of years ago passed a law that says starting January 1st, 2024, you know, less than a, a year away, you can no longer sell gas powered mowers. So uh, all new mowers are going to have to be sold as electric. Interestingly, we go to a, a, a big landscape show back in Kentucky every year. Two years ago, there was only about four manufacturers that had electric mowers. All the rest were gas powered. Last year, there were over two dozen electric mower companies, or there was a lot of companies that were introducing that they're going to be building electric. So not only are a lot of the gas mower companies going to electric, but the next step beyond electric is autonomous. Because everybody sees what's happening in the marketplace. Everybody knows it's coming. So we've got you know, several years head start on many of those. Uh, we do have a web-based platform. So uh, you can see on the screen, this is a helipad in Southern California. We are doing a lot of testing. We are able to, you know, on the iPhone, I keep, sorry, I keep pitching Apple, but I love their products. So on an iPhone, you can uh, map out the perimeter. You can go to Google Maps, you can map it out. And this is the outer perimeter. 
then you can state, okay, what direction do I want to mow? You can go north, south, east, west, you can do a cross cut. And that's important too, because also for the health of the lawn, you don't always want to be going in the same direction. You want to mix it up. Otherwise you start getting rutting patterns from the wheels and it's just healthier to, to mix it up like that. Also, the thing I like about having, you know, been in the landscape industry for over 30 years, you know, having run a landscape installation and maintenance company, by gathering this data, you'll get real time information on a particular job. How long does it take start to finish? You'll be able to get updates. You know, if it's 80% done and you need to come and get that mower to take it to the next job, you'll be able to do that. But also it will allow you, and now with the technology, you can go on to, there's various services that you can go to any job site and, and they'll measure how much lawn there is. Well, now you can take the square footage or acreage of lawn on a job. You can look at what is it, how is it similar to other jobs you've been doing? Enter that data in there so you'll know how long it will take to estimate that job. So again, with safety, on the left, you can see the multicolored screen. And this is what basically what the, the computer is saying. This is what the robot's saying. And you can see with the LIDAR, 360 degrees, if you look kind of upper left hand quadrant, you can just make out there's a person starting to walk into the path of the LIDAR uh, behind it to the left. You can see a person standing there. You can see the feet, the ankles, and it kind of gets a little bit dotted out at the thighs. Uh, we also put a bunch of soda cans all the way around it. That's what's uh, surrounding it. And so it can see the soda cans. They were lined up behind it. So that's what the LIDAR sees from a, uh, you know, kind of a visual perspective. Also from the cameras out in front, it has, that's the obstacle detection and avoidance. So it can, right now we've got the detection down. So uh, when a person walks in front of it, it identifies it as a person, it sees there's an obstacle, it will stop. It will just stop right there, stop running. When that person walks out of the way, it will continue on. What we really want to continue on is the obstacle avoidance so that if there's if it comes up to a branch that's fallen it will see that if it's not moving within a couple seconds it will go ahead and mow around it but again that obstacle avoidance is very difficult it takes a lot of engineering time so that's part of what we're uh, we're working on for our next version um like i said so we can swap out the mow deck so right now uh, we've got a uh, rotary blades but for golf courses, they require what's called real blades. So these are the, the lawn mowers that go like this. They, they can cut the lawn really low and fine. So the nice thing is, in, in fact, with the, uh, the golf course that we did the pilot, we would be able to use real blades on the fairways. We would be able to use it, uh, the rotary blades on the rough, first cut, second rough, uh, anywhere else. And then if you look at the bottom, the other thing is, uh, we can change out the, the Modex for a what's called a ball picker. It will pick up the golf balls at the driving range. So now with one, one unit, you can have th three different attachments to do different tasks. Also, uh, by being able to put on a fertilizer drop spreader. Again, this has already been programmed. This will have been programmed for a lawn area. So now anything a lawn needs besides mowing, uh, putting down fertilizers three or four times a year. Aerating. Uh, lawns should really be aerated in the spring and the fall. Most companies don't do it just because they don't have the equipment. Now they'll already have the equipment. They'll just need that attachment to do the aerating. And then, you know, further down the road, you know, for those, uh, those companies and those clients up in the north, northeast, uh, uh, Rocky Mountains, the Midwest, where they get snow and there's nothing to mow during the winter months, We'll, we'll be able to attach a snow blower. But again, that's, that's further down the road. I really wanna focus in on the 60 inch mower, some of the easier attachments, the real blades, the golf ball collectors, and uh, you know, stay real focused on what we're doing right now. Um, also, we're opening this up to some investor questions we've gotten you know, over the last several months, the last year. So one of them, can multiple units swarm to work together? Yes, this was a sod farm uh, in Southern California. Here we've got two, we ultimately had three. Uh, we, we've also talked to the, uh, the golf courses where they wanna get a, 
you know, a, an entire hole done in a night. So with our mowers, a lot of people will say, oh, there we go. So there's the three that are going in, uh, in unison. Thank you, Justin. But rather than trying to be all things to all people and say, hey, well, can you do a, a 24 inch mower for my backyard? Or can you do a, a 98 inch mower for big areas? We said, no, we're, we're sticking with the 60 inch, but with the 60 inch, you can put it in patterns where it's like a flying V, where you can have two or three or four of these mowing in unison for large areas. So that way, if you need to get, uh, you know, a par five, you know, done overnight, you'll just figure out, calculate the acreage and how many mowers you need to go and build and to, uh, you know, mow that, that uh, par five. Um, what's your current estimated acreage per hour of mowing? So with this version, we were at about three and a half uh, miles per hour, which is over one and a half acres per hour. But again, like I've said, I want to get us to do whatever an electric manually operated mower can do, which means I want to get it up to five miles per hour, which is, you know, over two, almost two and a half acres per hour. How can we ensure that the machine is safe? Do you follow any safety standards? Yes, I, I've talked about the LIDAR. Uh, we are doing a lot of testing on safety. Uh, currently, as we're running this and testing these, we have a person with uh, what's called an e-stop. That's an emergency stop button. So if it does see it, you know, going, you know, kind of out of control or wacky, they can stop it. They can figure out what's going on, you know, based on the, the sensors, the software, et cetera. So safety is critical to what we're doing. And we will certainly not put this out in the field to a client without having proven out any of the safety protocols that we feel necessary. And so even once we go to the gamma model, it's going to, uh, you know, we're probably gonna build about a dozen of them. Uh, you know, half of those to go out in the field with our person with the e-stop, with our, our crews, as well as doing bench testing. And it's gonna need thousands of hours of work in the field and you know, proven safe before we'll turn it over to a customer. So uh, some other investor questions, uh, you know, what's different about Graze's technology compared with other autonomous mower companies? So a lot of the autonomous mowers that are out there are fairly small, they kind of look like a Roomba, they're, they're good for residential, but that's not where we're going. We're going after the large commercial landscaping and because we've got that mow deck that's swappable, we're very versatile. We're, we're probably more versatile than any of the other ones out there. Uh, we're also electric, so that's why we're up at the top of this uh, this chart. Scythe is also 100% electrical, and uh, they're doing you know similar things to what we're doing. Uh, they don't have, I, I don't believe they've got the sensor suite that we have as far as the lidar, the cameras, the sensors. But they're they are building a great product, but their modec is underneath the chassis. So it's not as versatile, it's just to, to mow lawns, uh, they don't have the other attachments. But uh, you know, Greensy and Electric Sheep, what they're doing is they're building you know, more, more or less an autonomous kit to go onto existing mowers. But we said from the very beginning, we wanna do the hardware, the software, everything, that also helps us have stronger intellectual property. We have a couple of patents pending and it's, uh, it's stronger to have that IP if you're doing both the hardware and the software. Another in, couple of investor questions. Do you have a timeline for when you can start manufacturing and selling commercially? Yes, that's part of why we're doing the, the Series B raise now is we're looking to raise the money to ultimately go to commercial manufacturing. Uh, you know, even when we close this out, we're looking at other, you know, other uh, money sources, be it venture capital, investment bankers, we know it's gonna take a lot of money to get to uh, commercial production. And that's like I say, is it's probably gonna take about six, seven, eight months from when we've raised enough money to go to the contract manufacturing to get those first dozen. And then after that, raising more money, probably another six to nine months after that. So I think we're looking, you know, minimum one year, one and a half years before we're fully out uh, commercially uh, out in the marketplace. But before that, we will have certain programs and, and partners to uh, launch it in Southern California. 
So great question, how will grays be sold? So again, as we prove out the safety and we've proven to ourselves that it's reliable, efficient, then it will ultimately be able to be sold like any other lawnmower. Uh, somebody can buy it, somebody can lease it. Uh, we will have, because of the uh, computer, the uh, functionality, uh, we're looking at $1,000 a month RAS, robotics as a service. And the, the other extreme would be for those companies that don't wanna you know, put down the large investment to buy a mower, a monthly RAS, which would cover the lease costs. And then they're just, they're signing up for an agreement to just pay per month for our mower. But before we get to that point, we know there's an interim stage. So, you know, within the next year, our go-to-market strategy is a usage-based pricing model. It's what we call a pay-as-you-mow model. So we will figure out based on the job site, how big it is, the acreage, the obstacles, the terrain, charge them a certain amount per acre. Now we know, you know, having come from the landscape industry, the only way I as a CEO would have, you know, engaged in this is if you can do it at or below my current cost of mowing per acre. So we know we've got to be at or below uh, what their current cost is. And plus it takes away that problem of labor because we will take care of getting the mowers out there, the person with the e-stop and doing anything as far as uh, handling any software issues. So if, if a mower goes down, you know, we'll have another mower to go into place. Worst case scenario, we can have a manually operated mower because really all we're doing is we're making tall grass short. And so ultimately we've got to give them a solution to their problem, which is cutting grass. And we will do that. And the, the way I see it is it will go from maybe 70% the graze mower, 30% a conventional mower, the 80, 20, 90, 10. And until we get to hundred percent utilizing the graze mower and, and doing that for many months, we won't put it in the hands of, a, of an end user. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll open up to questions. The other thing I want to mention is our, uh, our crowdfunding, our Series B ends this coming Thursday. So we got, you got today, tomorrow, and Thursday. Also, we're going to be having another webinar on Thursday. Uh, Felix will be joining us. He, he brings a lot of uh, you know, great insight into the engineering, the products we're using, and he can answer all your technical questions. I'm not an engineer, I'm a landscape contractor, I don't try to be an engineer, but uh, we do have uh, a great team. So with that, Justin, if you can uh, open up to any questions. Yeah, thanks, John. I'm gonna start with a couple of uh, product uh, questions here. Um, one, uh, several questions about the battery technology that we're using. Um, uh, one gentleman had mentioned that we had previously had a, a version of Graze that had a solar a solar uh, unit on top, but um, John, do we have any plans to, um, or can you can you talk to us at all about uh, how we're thinking about the battery? How long does it take to charge? Um, these issues with you know the uh, expense of batteries and uh, exchangeable batteries, but can you just give us an idea of, of our general strategy in terms of um, the electric power source? Yeah, absolutely. Great question, and. You know, I'll start off by, you know, when I first started, uh, you know, working with Grays, you know, I went to a landscape show and I was, you know, very interested in the electric mowers because I knew we were building electric mower. Well, as it, what the person said was the battery technology, and this was back in 2019, they said, you know, two years ago, 2017, the batteries only had about two or three hours of charge time, which made it really not, uh, not viable for landscape contractors. And, and a gas powered or an electric mower is much more expensive than a gas powered mower. But he said, you know, back in 2019, the battery technology has really come a long ways. They're more powerful, they're smaller battery sizes. So back then they could get to about five to six hours of runtime, which then becomes viable for a landscape contractor that's working eight hours a day because they have a lot of what's called windshield time, getting from their their, their yard to the first job, from the first job to the second job, et cetera. So battery technology has come a long way, you know, even the past several years. And part of that is because of the push for electric vehicles. Everybody knows what Tesla is doing. They're building a, a huge battery factory in Nevada. The technology is getting better uh, because of the 
the, the chemical, the, uh, you know, the components that go into, and we're using lithium ion right now. And so now the mining industry is really growing. I think Tesla, Elon Musk just, you know, bought a, a mine or bought into a mining company. So that's kind of the next stage is there, there's a real push to electric. So batteries, there's going to be much more uh, technology going into it. Uh, you know, so I'll talk about the solar. When, uh, you know, some of you may have seen one of our first webinars, our, our first videos, there was a big solar panel about the size of a piece of plywood. But when we ran the numbers, it turned out that eight hours in the sun only gave it about 10 minutes of runtime. So we said, you know, that's that's great, but that's not enough bang for your buck. Let's go 100% with the batteries. So our next models went to the batteries. Uh, you know, we also know that there's there's a lot of change in the battery industry. There's uh, some others besides lithium ion, lithium ion, but lithium ion has the biggest bang for the buck and for the size compared to anything else. But there is a lot of technology going into hydrogen, but people know that hydrogen is very volatile, but that's where a lot of battery and uh, power technology is coming from. Also solid state. Uh, solid state may be the, the wave of the future, but again, as more and more companies and products go to lithium ion, there's going to be incentive to go to advance the battery technology. So great question. And the other thing is, like I said, we've got 40 kilowatt hours, so it'll run, you know, eight plus hours and it'll be able to be charged overnight with, a, you know, either a 110 volt or a 240 volt. Thanks, John. Um, Sean wants to know, can the mode deck be swapped out without human intervention? Um, and Additionally, can the mower detect or be programmed when to swap decks? Um, can you talk to us about that? Yeah, so, you know, a, a lot of what I talk about is, you know, what we're going to be doing in the future. Like I say, we've got the obstacle detection down. We're, we're working on the obstacle avoidance. So on the first question about swappable, uh, the answer is yes. At somewhere down the road, it will be able to go into a, uh, a, a port, you know, swap out the... Uh, the MODAC may be saved from a, a rotary blade mower to a real blade mower, but that's nowhere close on our product roadmap. But, you know, at some point in the future, we'll be able to do it. The other thing is batteries. You know, we, we may make it that it doesn't need a 40 kilowatt hour batteries for some, maybe it's a 20 kilowatt hour battery, and then people can change it out uh, just like you do with electric drills. You drill until your battery dies, and then you swap it out with a new battery, you keep drilling, et cetera. So I, I can see that happening. John, can you talk about the actuated mode deck, which can be controlled from the app? So Yes. Um, so yeah. even though you can't change out that front uh, component, you can raise and lower the, the cut height um, without physically um, Yes. Yeah. So I, I just want to clarify: it won't swap out the deck without manual, you know, moving it in and out. But for the mo deck to raise and lower, you can do that on an iPhone or a tablet. You can do that remotely. And then what I'm saying, you know, also going forward, as the technology gets better and it can see how tall is the grass, it will be able to automatically raise or lower, lower that mo deck to the appropriate height. Thanks. Uh, Sean had a, had a question about the safety system. Um, can so uh, I guess generally the that safety doctor component that's part of the new software package for Grace V three. Yeah. Um, yes. Can you give us an idea of like what 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 that does and and how that um, works as kind of a, a override for um, anytime there's a, a safety issue. Yeah, so the, the overall, so that what's important is that we have at least two different systems that are working in conjunction with each other. So we've got the LIDAR, which sends out the light rays, and it can see what's out there, but also we have cameras that can see three-dimensionally what's out there. So between the LIDAR and the cameras and even ultrasonic sensors all working together, if there's something that it recognizes as not lawn and shouldn't be there, it will stop. It'll, it'll, it'll stop the uh, mower from moving forward. It'll stop the blades from turning. And so that is ultimately what the safety doctor will tell you. 
uh, it will also be able to give you an idea of, you know, why did it stop? You know, was there a software glitch? Was there, uh, you know, something it didn't recognize? And that's also with the, with the artificial intelligence that it's going to help to correct itself to become better and better as we move forward. But, but the safety doctor is, is very important for what we're doing to get our different components to work together. And also, uh, like I said, Felix will be on the call Thursday. He'll be able to answer these more specifically with what that LiDAR does, what those sensors do, and how it works together. Thanks. A uh, couple of questions here about um, how we plan to service or maintain a fleet of mowers once they're in the field. Yeah, so this is, again, why we're starting with the pay-as-you-mow, because we will be able to take care of all of the services, getting to the mow site, programming the perimeters, et cetera. Once we've got it to the point where, say, we can sell the mower to somebody and, you know, charge them the $1,000 a month RAS, uh, it will be very easy for them, the, the uh, landscape contractor or the end user, the city, to go ahead and maintain. Really what they'll have to do is just like a electric vehicle, they'll just have to plug it in at night to recharge it. Uh, they will have to periodically change out the blades to sharpen them and you know when the blade deck is raised you know blow the uh, blow the debris but what's interesting you know talk to you know many ceos of landscape companies and those that have already have a, a tesla or an electric vehicle they say yeah my electric vehicle it's never in the shop i don't have to take it in every three months or three thousand miles like you do a, a gas powered mower or i mean a gas powered car because there's so many moving parts in a gas powered car or mower. You've got the belts, you've got the spark plugs, you've got oil, you've got all the parts that you do have to maintain with a conventional gas powered mower. And so that's another cost saving, not only that the electricity is less expensive than the gas, but the maintenance is much less expensive. And so the answer is, we'll take care of that. Uh, we're looking at some distribution models where uh, a dealer or distributor in that area, uh, if, if there is something like it, it, like something happens where a wheel falls off, they'll be able to service that. Not that we're expecting wheels to fall off, but things do happen. Is um, Grace planning to uh, partner with a contract manufacturing firm? Um, and they mentioned a, a, a California EV company called Monarch Tractors that was able to scale up using contract manufacturers. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, you know, I saw that too about Monarch Tractors because uh, we actually sold, you know, the company I work for, Jensen Landscape, to Monarch Landscape. And so I wondered if they were, you know, getting into the autonomous mower space, which they're not. But I, I did, uh, you know, catch that name of Monarch. But we are working and we have a, a letter of intent with a contract manufacturer called Benchmark. They're a $2 billion a year manufacturer. They've been, you know, primarily in the aerospace industry, uh, medical devices. Uh, they've come to our office. They've seen what we're doing. They're very excited with what we're doing, and you know, that's where we're looking to. And you know, we are we are talking to other contract manufacturers. Again, we've got to get the, you know, the the, the biggest bang for our buck for our ultimately for our customers. Uh, the other thing we talked about is just contract manufacturing the chassis. So the body, the wheels, the batteries, the computers, the sensors, and then we can go ahead and contract manufacture, say the Modex with an existing lawnmower company, uh, the real blades with an existing lawnmower company. There's companies that make the ball pickers. So I foresee us really going to contract manufacturing for the chassis, which is really, in my mind, it's just an autonomous vehicle that then we'll be able to take different attachments that we can then go to various companies to get those. This came, this question came up the other day, I was talking to somebody and, you know, as far as our, our go to market, you know, chances are that we'll be able to, uh, you know, deliver our mowers directly from the contract manufacturer to the end clients. And then for the different components, the attachments, those could be shipped separately to them. There, there's no reason to assemble both the mow deck and the chassis in one place. Uh, again, it's a matter of uh, reducing costs to the end user. Thanks. Um, 
A question from Paul. Uh, what regions of the U.S. have we tested the graze mower in the field? Yeah, so primarily we've done a lot in, uh, in California, obviously where we're located in Southern California. Uh, we, we have been out to Kentucky. We've done demos out there. Uh, we, we did another demonstration at the Cincinnati airport. It was, uh, it was kind of crazy because, you know, we go out there and I asked a man, what, what kind of fertilizer do you guys use? This, this grass is so green and tall. They're like, you know, we don't, we don't use fertilizer. It's just, you know, really good soil and they get a lot of rain, uh, you know, to the point that they had mowed the lawn on a Thursday. We were there to do our demo on Tuesday and the grass was already eight inches tall and we were gonna mow it down to four inches. I'm like, man, you, you never wanna take half the blade off, but we are doing it for demonstration purposes. Uh, the, the mower did a lot better than I thought I would under you know those conditions. So I know too, that there's a lot of different mowing conditions around the US. So really we've, we've done some mowing in the Midwest, a lot in uh, Southern California. Again, when I, when I sold the company to a uh, to Monarch Landscape, they also put me in charge of safety. So I got a chance to go to Texas, Colorado, Oregon, Washington, and in Northern California, when we get rains, we, it, it rains pretty heavily. And so we don't mow when it's raining. I asked the people in Seattle, I said, you guys not mow when it's raining? They said, if we didn't mow when it was raining, we'd never be mowing because it's <laughs> raining in Seattle. But we do know that there's a lot of different types of grasses and conditions. And so that's why, you know, we're going to roll this out and probably, you know, one of our you know, one of the pods that we do move to will be in that Midwest area, Kentucky, Cincinnati, uh, where we have done some some demonstrations. Thanks. Uh, Josh wants to know if you can elaborate on the margins for the Grace product going forward um, and the, the cost of developing and also the cost of landscapers. Yeah, so, you know, kind of working backwards, we know, uh, like I said, as, as a landscaper, you know, people coming to me with different ideas. Hey, if it can save me money, save me time, give me a quality cut, and now it takes out some labor that I don't have to worry about, that now I can, you know, upskill my laborers that are sitting on a mower to do integrated pest management or other higher, higher value tasks, then I'd be all over it. But it's got to start with, it's got to be, you know, at or below what they're currently paying for a manually operated gas powered mower. So that's kind of the starting point. Uh, as far as the margins, unlike the other, you know, the 37 plus landscape mower companies out there, they've got to operate on margins of selling their mower. So they've got to take care of not only the cost of the component parts, the distribution model, taking care of the distributor, the dealer, all of that, they've got to make a margin because then the value of their company is based on a multiple of EBITDA. Well, with us, we don't have to make a big profit margin on the mower itself because we've got the thousand dollars a month of RAS. In fact, we may determine to you know figure out the lease cost and charge a RAS of you know three or four thousand dollars a month, which is still going to be less expensive than a manually operated gas powered mower. So we will have an automatic advantage because we don't have the the margin pressures that a company has it doesn't have the autonomy piece. The autonomy piece takes away the need for a person, you know, making anywhere 17, 20 plus dollars per hour, plus the workers' comp insurance and everything and the, and the payroll taxes and everything that goes along with that. So we will be competitive or our customers wouldn't be buying it. Sure, sure. Uh, 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 we found that in our study with Mainscape that we could reduce with autonomous mowing, we could reduce a crew of, of five folks down to two. Um, does that uh, does that labor saving model hold up in different use cases? For example, in a solar field, in an airport, in a highway median um, situation? Yeah. So, yeah, so here's the thing is, you know, I don't know that it was five to two. I think it was more like a, a four man crew or four person crew down to two. But again, that's gonna be dependent upon how many mowers you have that are being utilized by that crew. So if you're doing, you know, a sod farm, you know, you've got everybody's on a mower all day, every day. Uh, if you've got, you know, large city parks, you've got the majority of that crew mowing lawns. If you've got, 
you know, an HOA that has, you know, postage stamp lawn here and, you know, big shrub areas here and a play area there, you know, kind of your, your percentage of, of lawn mowing compared to the rest of the project will go down. So again, that's where we're really going after large jobs with large lawns where it makes sense to use a 60 inch mower the majority of the day. The other, the other issue with landscape contractors is, you know, they're going from job to job to job and they'll have a 60 inch mower on their trailer, you know, whether they need it or not. Some jobs only require a 48 inch mower or a, a 36 inch mower. And when they're doing that, you got a, you got a 60 inch mower sitting on the truck that on the trailer that's not being used. So you're depreciating that over a year, but then it really comes down to how much are you using it in the year? So again, with our pay as you mow model, our point is to get the usage of every mower, you know, up to seven hours per day. And that's gonna really help cut that cost to that landscaper. The other thing in this model, if we handle all of the mowing or all the large mowing or the bulk mowing, well, now they can send out maybe a two person crew and they don't even have to send the trailer. They don't have to send the big mowers or the smaller mowers. They can take a pickup truck with edgers, blowers, rakes, trash cans, and that's gonna save them fuel because they're not towing around a big trailer weighted down by heavy mowers. So there's a lot of reasons why what we're doing makes sense to landscape contractors and to cities. John, in your presentation, uh, how much of the value is seen in the mowing service versus the additional data um, that uh, Grace can collect about the property? Yeah, so I think, you know, for the most part, you know, landscapers, landscape contractors, property managers, they've got so many other things they're focused on. They just want to make sure that they can get the lawn mowed at a price at or below their cost. You know, there are companies like Mainscape that, that do a lot of tracking of their costs. I can see a company like that really get gleaning a lot of good information from, you know, I did this job to take, you know, three hours with a 60 inch mower. How long is it actually taking? And how can we reduce that, that time and that cost? So, uh, you know, some contractors are gonna utilize a lot of the data for, you know, estimating purposes going forward some contractors, they don't even know what they're spending per hour to mow. They don't, a lot of companies, they don't take into account the depreciation of their mower. They say, oh, I'm paying a guy $17 an hour. You know, that's my cost. I already own the mower, so I've already paid for that. So the extremes are, are very different between a, a one-person operator versus a multi-billion dollar company that really assesses everything and utilizes the data. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, I have a question here from David. Uh, will, will Grace remember the GPS coordinates for each property? Oh, yeah, great question. I, I should have mentioned that, you know, with our web-based platform. Once you've entered in the, the perimeters where you want it to mow, any Grace mower will be able to know that it's within that area, within that geofence, and will be able to mow. So it's not just specific to one mower and it's not specific where you, that there are some companies out there that you've got to set the perimeter every time. And, you know, I just said, no, it, 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 that's ridiculous. You don't want to do that. You want to be able to set the perimeter once. It's got to be remembered. It's in the cloud. So any grace mower will know that perimeter. And, and it, it's, it's got to too, because let's say there is a, a glitch with a mower and you got to trade it out with another one you, you don't want to lose time reprogramming the perimeter. You want to go in and mow. Got it, thanks. Uh, uh, is Grace able to recognize wildlife, like deers, turtles, things like that? <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, again, uh, you know, we, we always say, you know, not only are we going to avoid people, but puppies and kittens and, uh, you know, anything that a human can recognize, we want it to be able to recognize. So it's important that, you know, we really work on that obstacle avoidance because obstacle detection is going to see something. Let's say it, it sees a cat that's lying down in the grass. It's going to stop. If it doesn't stop, we, we got problems, bigger problems, you know, than uh, just running over a, a cat. 
So that's, again, why the engineering is so important and we're having both the LIDAR and the cameras and the sensors all working together for very strong obstacle detection and more importantly, work on the obstacle avoidance. But yeah, that, that all goes to the safety. Uh, it's gotta be able to recognize obstacles that are not grass. And so there's all kinds of things that we can put in to the memory, you know, knowing tortoises, cats. Uh, there is a company that um, has developed the ability to see different types of weeds. So robotically, it can identify weeds in the soil and spot spray it with Roundup. So we can use similar technology to, you know, recognize people, animals, obstacles, et cetera. Thanks. Uh, question from Jeffrey, who has a landscaping business. Um, he's curious about a payback uh, timeline for a small commercial landscaper that does around 250K revenue a year. Um, and I, I guess, John, could you maybe go into if they were going to buy it outright versus if they were going to try to do a, a pay as you mow, um, what would the what would the payback look like for a small contractor like that? Well, I'd say if you're doing 250,000 a year, if it's the majority of it is with a 60 inch mower, then that would make sense. But again, you've got to run the numbers because, uh, you know, at 250,000 a year, you, you might have one 60 inch mower you know, maybe a, a, a 21 inch, maybe a 36 inch, but you, you wouldn't want to buy it if you're not utilizing it at least five hours a day, four days a week. And, you know, so again, we, we, we can't be everything to everybody, but what, what we're really going after, especially to start with, is large lawn areas. Now, it could be that you've got one job where you're using a 96 inch mower on a park, but you're only doing it one day a week. Well, that's where our pay as you mow model would work. You'd only be utilizing our mowers, you know, every Tuesday, but that way you don't have the big upfront cost of buying a, a 96 inch mower that you're only using one day a week. You got and, and that pay as you mow model that that uh, would you wouldn't own the mower in that case you're you're just you're paying when you use it and when you're not using it you're 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 not paying grazing other other people would be using the mower is that right yeah yeah the pay as you mow model it now it's got to make sense for us to deploy a mower you know where we can utilize it you know either six or seven hours a day or we're deploying it, deploying it next door to another job that we're using it, you know, four or five hours a day. Uh, so it, you, you don't have to own the mower. You might have one particular job with a 60 inch, you know, and, and obviously it's gotta be in a location where we've got other pay as you mow customers where we can fit that in to the scheduling. You know, what I know too is even some of the, the you know, some of the, the top 10 landscapers in the country in Southern California, We'd ask them, well, where do you have some big lawn areas to mow? They say, okay, well, we got this one, you know, job site over here, but then there's another job that's 20 minutes away. Well, it doesn't make sense for us to be driving 20 minutes with that windshield time, whereas between those two jobs that that one company has, there's probably three or four other jobs, you know, on that route that we could go and uh, use our pay as you mow model. So we're not locked into just one company needing to use it every day, five, six days a week. We can piecemeal it to different contractors so that they're ultimately getting their lawns mowed at a lower price per acre. Thanks. I do have a question that actually came up uh, before, uh, which is, uh, will the mower be able to sense weather like rain or standing water? And if so, what will, uh, how it will react? Yes, yeah, so in uh, Seattle, it will sense rain and it will keep mowing <laughs> as they have to. But yes, that's the other thing is it's a uh, it, it's 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 not only a smart mower. It's basically it's a computer that can mow lawns. So we can put all kinds of sensors on it. If it's detecting heavy rain, we're going to want it to stop. It can send an alert back to say, hey, you know, it, it's too the, the rain's too heavy. You don't want to be mowing lawn when it's wet, when it's, you know, laying over, it's not good for it. You're going to get rutting, you're going to get mud. So for every job site, you can set some of the, uh, you know, the, the weather criteria of when to mow, when not to mow. But uh, 
you know, also the other big thing is irrigation. You know, there's a lot of smart controllers out there that will, you know, turn on or off irrigation based on tying into a local weather station that, uh, you know, has that data. We also don't want to be mowing when the irrigation is going off. So we can, we will ultimately get to the point where it'll be able to communicate with not only weather stations, but with irrigation controllers so that it's not going out there or can send a flag saying, hey, this was just mowed this morning. We shouldn't be mowing. So not only weather, but smart controllers. Thanks. I know we're running out of time here. A couple more questions, John. Um, is Grace open to an acquisition by a larger competitor? Is that something that you see as a viable exit strategy for Grace? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. And, you know, the way I see it is there, there's a couple of uh, paths to liquidity. You know, when I was, uh, you know, running Jensen Landscape, you know, we, we went through the, we, we made it through the Great Recession, 2008, a couple of years later, 2010, we were approached by one of the largest landscape contractors to, to acquire us. And I just said, no, you know, we've got a little ways to go. Thank you, but we're not ready to sell. Uh, I, I think that's kind of where we're at now. You know, we're on the path to building something great. And, you know, I, I think once we get to revenue and we've got contract manufacturing proof of concept, we'll be a real target for, you know, one of the big boys to come by us, whether that's Toro or John Deere or Honda. But uh, again, I got to look at what's in the best interest of our investors. If we sold now, we wouldn't capture, you know, all the hard work we've done up until now. If we, you know, work a little longer, get to the proof of concept, get revenue, we will not only be a more attractive acquisition for somebody, we'll be able to sell at a higher price. The other, the other path could be, you know, going to a, ultimately to an IPO. But right now our focus is on, you know, building a great product, building a great company with a great product offering. And you do that, you build it, and they will come. Where, where, where'd I hear that? <laughs> um, okay, so I mean, I, a lot of really great questions. Thanks so much for everyone who's, um, who's putting these out there. We're going to get the uh, team on these uh, responses as soon as we get off the call today. But uh, quick, a quick question from Tom here about the redundancy of operations. So if there's an issue with the internet connectivity, um, will the mower still be able to mow? Yeah, yes. And so first I want to say too, a lot of great questions. You know, maybe when we do the, the one on Thursday, I'll do less talking, more answering. We'll also have uh, Felix to answer the, the more technical questions. Uh, but as far as redundancy, that's why it's so important to have multiple sensors the LIDAR, the, uh, the, the the ultrasonic sensors, the cameras working in conjunction. So if one thing goes down, you've got a backup system. Again, Felix with his experience in Waymo is, you know, you, you don't want to be so reliant on one that, you know, the sun, it's low in the on the horizon, either early in the morning or late in the day, and now you're blinded. You know, when that happens to be in the car, you know, you put your hand out in front of the sun, or you can lower the visor. But uh, this is an autonomous machine. It's got to have backup sensors to uh, maintain that safety, and it's got to have that redundancy. And and we're not just we're, and believe me, we're not just tied into what we're using now. You know, we're also looking at uh, radar in conjunction with lidar. We're looking at the technology that you see at the uh, at the airport by the TSA as you're walking through. That uh, you know will sense what's you know on your skin, but not through your skin. So that there's a lot of technology and a lot of different uh, components we're looking at that we will, I'm, I'm sure, ultimately use in our, our next model, the Gamma model, as we go to production. Awesome. Uh, Thanks uh, again, everyone. Uh, John. I really appreciate all the uh, information. And uh, I've thrown it up here on the screen just so people can check it out, uh, the and, and, uh, investment page. Again, our, our campaign is uh, closing on Thursday as the final day of our Series B. Um, our, I want to quickly mention that our previous rounds have oversubscribed, so not everybody that uh, wanted to invest was able to invest. You know, we're, we're only able to sell a certain number of shares that we have been authorized. So um, just want to encourage everyone, if you're interested, check it out. Uh, and then, uh, John, uh, thanks again so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I hope you invest. Take care. Cheers. Hi, guys, and welcome back. So my thoughts on that Gray's webinar I thought what was really interesting a couple of things um, really jumped out at me um, and that was that the 
machines themselves are going to be able to swap things out so you can have just a normal uh lawn, you know commercial lawn mower but then you'll also have a real blade for golf uh, so you'll be able to adjust uh, how much you cut and a, a proper blade for different uh use cases and eventually a ball picker which will be able to collect balls from a ball from a golf course so when it's not cutting a golf course sees additional may see additional um kind of value um by having a ball picker uh, later on they may also look at fertilizer drop spreading aerators snow blowers and things like that something else that jumped out was um the unit economics i think are pretty good for everybody the fact they have a robot as a service model which is something i talked about many years ago of being a model i'd never heard of it and i don't think it was uh, around in the kind of uh, in the robotics space um, but i think i coined it as a question originally a year or two ago in ally robotics or maybe three years ago um either with ally robotics or Miser robotics nevertheless i think that the robotics as a service model is a good one i.e similar to software as a service renting out a robot for the foreseeable so if they have very good build quality then a manufacturer of robotics um equipment or products like rays could make recurring revenue for a long period of time also like this idea of pay as you mow i.e it might take some time to produce many, many, many units. And in the meantime, the Grace company could identify users and customers that are located close to one another and actually help them mow the lawns, renting their mowers out by the hour or whatever, and coming up with an income source in the interim from that as well. What I think about this company, Graze, is kind of similar to Mesa Robotics and to a certain extent Ally Robotics. They're part of a similar group. They're at a similar early stage at the time of filming in 2023. But there's a lot of interest in the company. If they can execute, if they can build the quality product, which I kind of think they can because it's a lot more simple than you know, a flipping robot or, you know, some of the products that you can see, uh, like Ally Robotics is a lot more complicated, um, I believe. So they have the they have the speciality, they have the teams of people, they have the robotics understanding with, you know, uh, with all of those partner companies, as well as the support of people, I imagine, like, um, you know, like, mike and uh buck jordan you know i imagine they've got they're all kind of sharing the the same resources and knowledge but i think the use case of mowing lawns is probably the most straightforward in my mind uh, and i might be completely wrong there and um, please don't shout me down or, or or have a go at me in the comments if i am wrong but once they get it right um i would assume that in the large lawn space it will be right for some time and there aren't lots of uh, variations um, and there probably isn't the, there might not be the manufacturing headache that Mesa Robotics might have for example I don't know I'm just throwing it out there but with Grays they might only need two or three thousand mo uh, lawn mowers in the whole of the US I might be wrong there maybe it's 30,000 um, but even if it's 3,000 or 30,000 that's nothing like the amount of flipping machines um that will be needed to service the quick service restaurant market for a company like Mesa robotics which if you haven't checked out i've got tons of videos on them i'm an investor in both of these companies by the way so i am comparing them because i think it's interesting to understand where the companies are in their development and when they might get to revenue when they might get to profit when they might get to a funding event yeah sorry a um a liquidity event so with grays i think they're very early and the valuation probably reflects this i, I can't imagine it's high valuation Mesa robotics was 
500 mil. They've had a down round now, so I think it's about three or 400 mil. Uh, but Grays, it's quite early on. So I think that's good. And, you know, it is eye catching. You see those videos. And if I were in landscape gardening, which I'm not, I'd be thinking, yeah, I need to, uh, I need to get one of these Grays mowers. So like all of the companies, it's a little bit asymmetric. I think that if they can do well and manufacture these, they could be worth a lot of money. There are competitors, as you saw in the video um, at the time uh, when they were showing the video. Nevertheless, I think Grays are in a fantastic position. They seem to have good people. I need to check out if that guy um, where he was working at Meta, because I can search for it on my Meta laptop, uh, what kind of roles he was doing at Meta. Nevertheless, I like Grays. Uh, I can't invest in it again at this point just because of my uh, some current circumstances in my family. But if I had the money, would I invest in this round? Probably, yeah, probably would. I think Grays is an early stage. So with these companies, the risk stays the same. They can go bust now. They could go bust in three years. They could go bust in five years. But the upside is better when you invest earlier. So if you're a kind of angel investor and you're looking to invest in early stage companies, often it's easier to invest early on because the risk of going bust doesn't really change in year three compared to year five that materially. Because um, as you saw in this video earlier on, they were saying they're going to need to raise additional rounds of capital. In most cases, in a lot of cases, they're going to be up rounds and not going to be down rounds. Um, I can be wrong, of course, um, but I prefer to invest when the valuations are 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million, not when they're three, four, 500 million. Um, because yes, the risk may have reduced slightly, um, but I think the, the upside has been reduced as well. Guys, I hope you enjoy this video. It is quite late my time here. It is 10, 15 GMT time PM. Um, so my voice is getting a little bit hoarse. But remember, if you want to want, learn more about robotics, investing in startups, angel investing, indeed, even the listed equity markets with shares and stocks, then do check out my other videos. Make sure that you like and subscribe this video. It really helps support the channel. At the moment, I'm doing all of this for free. I don't have any support from anybody. I enjoy doing this, um, but any way you, in any way you can help, please feel free to do so. And in what way I might hear you ask, you can like subscribe comment let me know what you think of these videos and share these videos with someone that might be interested in investing in alternative asset classes like angel investing it's very exciting to follow these companies and you never know in some cases they might do quite well remember that knowledge is power and progress is everything i'll see you guys in the next upcoming video one of these which i hope you'll enjoy and watch take care